Good morning again, everybody, or good afternoon. It's 12 noon, so I really don't know. We are right in the transition, so good day, I guess. Okay. Today is March the 22nd. As I was telling one of you guys earlier, there is some minor things that you guys need to keep track of, namely the fact that uh, uh, on the 31st, which is not this Wednesday, but the next Wednesday, the Wednesday after uh, this Wednesday, there will be no class because it's a holiday, okay? So uh, what I'm going to do is today, hopefully to cover chapter 25. I'm going to do a little bit of problems from it, but mainly leave all of the problems from chapter 26 and you will see why I'm thinking that way. Because really chapter 25 intro introduces the concept of resistor, resistance, chapter 26 deals with the, uh, with, the, with the circuits, okay? So that includes some of the ideas from chapter 25, but in far more complicated fashion, if you wish, because you will have resistors combining with other resistors and again, series and also parallel. In addition to that, you will also have capacitors involved, in which case you will be able to do something called charging a capacitor or discharging a capacitor which is going to be part probably from one of your, uh, our future uh, labs in this class. So again, in terms of concepts, the main concept that is going to emerge from today's lecture are two things. First of all, uh, the concept of resistance, electrical resistance and conductors, which is very important. And the second concept is the, uh, the Ohm's law. Okay, which is very important, which is for sure a lab in the future, okay? So that is basically what the two key concepts that are going to, uh, to emerge from this expression. There is a real Ohm's law that we're going to explore in chapter 27, 25, I'm sorry. And then we say, okay, you know what? We're not gonna be calling this one is to Ohm's law. We're going to like this one instead and we're going to call it Ohm's law. That everybody else calls Ohm's law. And that is the one that we actually we're going to be testing in the, uh, in the lab, not the real one, okay? Because when Mr. Ohm put, put this law, he actually, his mind also was intended for the, uh, to, for the derived formula, which we're going to get into. So let's get going. So materials, of course, I think we have already alluded to the fact that at least there is two classifications of materials. There are conductors and insulators. We're, we don't care for insulators at this point uh, for the rest of the, at least this, this two chapters but we will see the distinction between them a little. And then there is another kind of material, namely semiconductors, which they are somewhere in between, okay? Sometimes they're good conductors, sometimes they're good insulators. So that is basically the, the, the three types of materials. There is another class of materials called superconductors, and those materials are way outside of the scope of this class, but we probably are going to also talk a little bit about them, not to do any much with them in terms of problems and things like that. Does this sound like it's a good plan? Uh, yeah, Professor, could you repeat the name of the third class of material? So uh, there is the conductors, insulators. Then there are semiconductors, the ones used in electronics everywhere. Okay. And then there are superconductors. Semiconductors like mainly of uh, germanium and silicon. And those are materials they have uh, when you dope them when you add impurities in them, they become uh, the so-called P-type uh, doping or N-type doping. And we're gonna get into this at some point. And those are basically what makes the so-called PN junctions for uh, things like diodes. This is actually PN junction. Oops, it dropped. Okay, this is a diode. This is actually semiconductor. And then transistors, I don't have any transistors before me. Those are actually PNP or NPN uh, uh, connections. We're getting to those things, okay? So uh, for right now, we're going to stick to conductors. Conductors are basically, uh, the simplest model of it is that they have, you have a bunch of atoms sitting next to one another and each and every one of them can afford to basically uh, 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 give one or two at most. I mean, most of conductors, they can at most give two. Sometimes there is exceptions, but this is basically the rule of their valence electrons outside basically so that they can move freely. So in other words, you can think of a conductor as essentially a cloud of electrons willing to move whichever way the electric field is applied to it, okay? It's like a gas really of electrons. 
at any given point in the conductor, the electrical charge is zero. In other words, those ions are still holding the same number of charges to compensate for those electrons. The mere fact that the one electron is contributed and can move freely, another one will replace it at any given time. So in other words, if you take a region of a conductor, it stays of charge zero. And this is true for any kind of materials, actually. I mean, semiconductors too, they have that property too. So uh, an insulator where you remove from it a charge and the atom there can do much, basically. It can stay ionized, basically. If it gained an electron, it becomes negatively charged. It lost an electron, it becomes positively charged. And then the, nothing. I mean, at that point, in the field, zero one inside an insulator, you may find uh, uh, regions where net positive or net negative charge, OK? And but for those, there is uh, the valence electrons, basically, they're all tightly uh, held in place, OK? Anyway, we'll get into this details. Let's 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 take an example. Let me first of all get into my notes first. And we are doing chapter twenty-five, CH twenty-five. Okay. Share. Screen. Okay. So again. We are talking mainly, like I said, about the conductors right now, okay? I mean, even insulators, to some extent, you're going to find the theory works for them, except that they will have a resistivity that is so high compared to insulators. So materials in general, like I said in here, they have, uh, if I take a cross-section cross of a conductor, okay? It has, like I said in here, charge carriers. For all we care about is they can move. So I'm going to give them the symbol Q. And this is actually a good reason why to give that is because down the road, we're going to be dealing with the semiconductors. And you will see that it's not necessarily negative charges that are responsible for conduction, but positive lack thereof of negative charges that do that. And in either case, so we have a charge Q in here that can move, OK? For all practical purposes, take Q positive. If Q turn out to be negative, it's moving in the opposite direction no more. Under the influence of an electric field, of course. If there is no electric field, what happened in here, each electron is moving or each charge is moving in every single direction in a random fashion. I'm trying to draw a random motion, okay? So every charge is moving every which way. So the random motion for the charges in here on average is zero. Okay. And the thermal equilibrium conditions no, no net. Uh, uh, Displacement of charges. Displacement of charges. So what's going on? If you look at what's going on in here in this case, every charge, like for example, I'm still describing the electron with the gas cloud of, I mean, a conductor with a gas cloud of electrons that can move every which way. But each time one of them moves, collides with an ion, with a sitting basically atom, and uh, during the collision, it can come out whatever direction it, uh, the collision will dictate, basically, okay? So it could come out this way, that way, in every single direction. Because of this collisions, and this is due to heat, usually, to, uh, to thermal agitation, to temperature, really. Okay? So temperature, in this case, will require that the materials will collide and, and end up in all directions. So there is no net displacement of the current. Now, in the presence of the electric field, if now I turn on the electric field, I'm taking cross-section A, by the way, in here. In the presence of the electric field, now net charges will start moving. Do you guys see that? So a charge, like, for example, uh, Q. So if the electric field is here, and the charge, for example, was moving in this direction, so now, is going to start moving along the direction of the electric field. If the charge was already moving in this direction, so now it's going to accelerate, okay, in this direction, okay? 
So that is basically what's going on. So if I apply an electric field now, even the charge that was moving in the opposite direction to the electric field is going to slow down and then start moving in the opposite direction. So there is now a, a net effect of the electric field to cause the charges to move in one direction versus another. You guys understand? And that is the direction of the electric field. Does this make sense? Yeah, I'm, I can't see the chat. Let me see if I can. I can't pull it. I'm sorry. So if you guys are chatting, and I know this was flashing for me, so I can't really see. Okay, very good. So this is because of the fact that F equals to QE. Okay. I'm not making any assumption about the sign of Q whatsoever. Q could be positive or negative. Okay, so that is basically in a nutshell. So if the Q is positive in this case, this is the true picture. And the current will be defined as the current in this direction. So this is the current direction. If Q is positive, okay? And the charges will be moving in this direction, in the direction of the electric field. Now, if the Q is negative actually, the charges will be moving this way and the current will still move in this direction. So in other words, the fact that the charge negative is moving in the to the to this direction, I can think of it as a charge moving in the opposite direction because this is what's going on. In the first case scenario, so this is an ion, okay? This is another ion. And let me draw a third one only for the case of the person. This has an electric charge in here, this has an electric charge in here, and this is an electric charge. In the first case, so we have a positive charge moving here and another positive charge moving here to replace it, of course, because you want to stay neutral in here no matter what. And another positive charge moving here. So you have a net effect of positive charges moving along the field itself. In the second case, what you have in here, you still have ion in here, you have another ion. This is really the real picture of what's going on, by the way. And this is another ion. So the charges are actually negative. Actually, they are electrons to, uh, to make sure. So this electron will move in here. So as if a positive charge would, move, would have moved in there. The same thing with this is the actual movement of the actual charges as if a positive charge in here. So it's the net effect is the same. So whether the, the positive charges are moving to the right or the negative charges are moving to the left in the sense that as if the positive charges are moving to the, to, to the other side. And that's the end of it. So the current in here at the end does not really depend, should not depend on the sign of the charges. That is the moral of the story in here. So that is basically the conclusion in here that we have to do. Let's come up with some quantities now of interest. Mr. Ohm. speculated that the current density, which is he defined as basically uh, the current divided by the cross section, so namely J, must be proportional to the electric field and only is affected by the, uh, affected by the, uh, the, uh, the type of material. Some materials, they present a better uh, suitability for this conduction than others. Some of the materials will resist more to this activity than the others. So he expressed this in terms of rho. So let me let me talk in terms of what is current density and what is current and so on and so forth. Okay. So the current is the amount of charges that travel per unit time. So this is by definition of the current. So the current is the rate of flow of charges. It's like the traffic, for example. You go on top of the freeway, on top of the 215, and you look at the on a bridge, for example, and you look at the cars passing by, okay? And you count how many cars pass by. So this is will be the flow of traffic in one second, how many cars? In one minute, how many cars? In one hour, how many cars pass by? So you take your watch, now you start timing, and you see how many cars pass by. Let's say, for example, in an hour, I don't know, about 
traffic on a given amount of day. So we'll assume we're going to have a traffic. So let's say, for example, 300 cars pass per day. So that would represent the flow of traffic in that case. We're not talking about the flow of traffic. We're talking about the flow of charges in this case. So this is the current. By the, uh, the definition for the current, I mean, by this definition, the unit for it is an ampere, okay? You ask what is an ampere? It's one Coulomb that pass by second, okay? So now this is a fundamental unit. This is the last fundamental unit that you're gonna see in your physics classes. You were introduced to the meter, you were introduced to the kilogram, and you are introduced to a second as standards of measurements for length, mass, and also a time. Now this is the standard unit for measuring currents. In other words, we've been using Coulomb all along up to this point, and the Coulomb from this definition is clearly not a fundamental unit, but it's just an ampere times second. So this is the Coulomb, which is really a, an SI unit also, just like the Newton and the Pascal and everybody else, but it is not a fundamental unit. The Coulomb that we have introduced, the unit for charge, I'm sorry, which is a Coulomb, was a derived unit in terms of the more fundamental unit, which is a current. So the current now is something that I can measure with an emitter. So if I have a device that somehow I can gauge and look at, now this becomes like just like the ruler that you have at home. This is actually a device that measures your, your, your current. And from this point on, we have a way of actually defining what the charge is. So the charge is actually defined in terms of this uh, uh, ampere is when one ampere passes by one sec second, I would say that I have one Coulomb that has gone through. So one Coulomb, take one amp of a current and wait one second. One amp, by the way, is a lot of current, by the way. I mean, in real life, one amp is a lot of current that passes in one second. That is one full Coulomb of charges. And if you're asking how many electrons pass by, that is actually the inverse of this number. which is roughly 10 to the power 18 charges, or electrons, I should say. OK, so that is one, one Coulomb is of charges. It's a huge number of them. It's, it's not as big as an Avogadro's number. So when we were describing it as a gas, we really were not too far from the picture that is in thermodynamics. So this is not too far-fetched, this picture in here. Okay the one that we were describing it. So it's a huge number, okay? So one amp, even half an amp is still that big of a number. Even milliamp is still a huge number. So statistically speaking, this picture is not far-fetched. Okay, I know the picture we draw only probably what? Not even probably 20 electrons in here. So it's not even close from picturing this thing, but that is basically a model that we're going with. So in other words, this is basically what we're saying in here. That is the definition of the current. What I'm going to define now is the current density. J is just the current per unit area. So this is the current density. And the units for J are, so this is by definition, OK, is, uh, of course, the amp divided by the unit in area, which is the amp per meter squared, OK? So this is the unit, how many amps that, passes, that can pass through a cross section. So in other words, if I take a meter squared in here of area, that is what the current density is in this case, okay? The current that I measure with my ammeter with this device is going, to be the current, uh, is going to be the current density. If I take a smaller area, obviously, I'm going to have a higher current, in the, I mean, a smaller current because A times J is going to be uh, just that number, okay? So this is basically how we're, we're going to define this quantity. So Mr. Ohms proposed the following law that the current density, just to, the reason why you would want to work with the current density, because you know, the bigger the area, it's like the bigger the, the hose, the more water is going to flow through it. So the flow fluid in this case is going to accommodate more water. The wider the freeway, and if we assume that the, the, the flow of traffic is uh, the same, then the more cars that pass through it. But the smaller it is, the less cars are going to pass through it. So I'm think of a narrow road and how many cars can skip through it. So in this case, if you expect steady flow, you're going to have less, less, less. So that is the thinking about it. So instead of thinking how, how wide the freeway is or how big the, the, the hose is, then we're going to just come up with a meter square and define that and start working with that, okay? So for a given material, 
the area now has been trivial, uh, became, became trivial, okay? Rendered uh, not important in this relationship. What matter is the material itself now. The material can be more resistive than other. So if I bring copper, for example, it's not gonna behave as iron. It's not gonna behave as wood. So if I take a piece of wood, for example, or a piece of plastic and subject it to a difference in potential or an electric field in this case, which is the same, then in this case, I don't expect the same behavior from wood than copper, for example, because copper, I know I can measure higher current on it than piece of wood. So in this case, the, the expression that he basically theorized or at least uh, uh, showed experimentally works is this law. Where rho is the resistivity. I know we just resistivity. We just have been dealing with this, with this, uh, with this uh, rho as being the charge density, but this definition of rho is slightly different. In this case, is how much resistive the material is. If the material is highly resistive, you're going to have less current density, less current at the end of the day, okay? Because current density is just the current per unit area, okay? So if you increase the area, it's still going to be less current for the new area, okay? Uh, the less rho is, the less resistive the material is. So resistivity measures how much a conductor is good or bad. High rho, bad conductor. This can be an insulator. Low rho is what you really want. is good conductor. But sometimes you really don't care about conductivity, you care about insulation. For example, these wires, I don't want the current to flow through them. It doesn't matter which wires, I just grab this wire, okay? It, you don't want current to come out from this end to somewhere else. You don't want the current to leak. So you'd want in this case is an insulation. So sometimes actually having higher row is, is, is necessary. So. The fact that I could good, good or bad is not necessarily it's from the vantage point of conduction, but from the vantage point of insulation, it's the other way around. So a good insulator is bad conductor and bad conductor is a good insulator. So that is basically in a nutshell on here. So it's a good conductor or bad insulator if you really care about insulation. Okay, so this is really Ohm's law. Sometimes you will find Ohm's law written differently. J equal to sigma e, where sigma by definition is one over o, rho. Sigma is the conductivity. So it's just the opposite or the inverse of uh, the uh, resistivity by definition. So all of these things are by definition. Most of the materials behave more or less in this linear fashion. When the electric field becomes too big, I'm talking description now experimentally, what we see in the experiment. There is no theory yet. So we don't have any anything to explain what's going on really yet. We're gonna get into it shortly. But the point being in here is this is what's going on based on observation. When the electric field is weak, the current density works this way. It's proportional to the electric field, either expressed in terms of the resistivity as I expressed it in here, or in terms of the conductivity, which is just the inverse of the uh, resistivity. Please do not confuse the sigma and the rho that we've been dealing with so far as being the charge the per unit area or the charge Per unit, per unit volume. Those have nothing to do with this rho and sigma. Okay, sigma in the past was Q over A. This is not what we're doing today. Rho was in the old days Q over V. That's not what we're doing today. As a matter of fact, rho prior to that was mass per unit volume, the density, and sigma also was a mass per unit area. That's what you did in physics for A. So those are old symbols. Right now, Rho and sigma were chosen in such a way to describe the materials and how good or bad of a conductor uh, conductors they can be, or how good or bad of being also an insulator. The story in here is reversed. High sigma means it's a good conductor. High conductivity means it's a good conductor. Bad insulator. Low sigma in this case being a bad conductor or good insulator. So that is basically the, the, the description. Most of the literature uses either sigma or E, it doesn't matter. So at the end, 
they are equivalent because that is really how the, uh, the relationship between the two are. Does this point make sense? Very good. Here is item of the discussion that I really want you guys, since you're gonna be doing problems today and this week and starting from this point on, do not confuse sigma and sigma or rho and rho. And I want you to elaborate, elaborate on that, okay? This is the point. Rho, there are a bunch of rows everywhere. There are a bunch of sigmas everywhere. Today, we mean the conductivity and or the, the, uh, the, uh, the resistivity. This is how the literature is. This is how the book laid out. This is how everything is. And physicists usually don't get confused about this one. So hopefully when you're doing your problems, you are not confused about it. Make sense? Good? Very good. Yeah. So that is the point today. So I really want you guys to be on top of this point in here, okay? Now, uh, let's see what's going on. Okay. Let's go back to the picture that we started with, namely here. So we have charges that are moving at random every which way. So I'm going to pick one of them and see him follow it, okay? So one of these charges was already has a random, so Q, has a random velocity, okay? So pick and choose. It doesn't matter which direction it has, okay? But now we apply an electric field to it. So when we apply an electric field to it, we're going to say F equals to MA for this charge. But I know what F is. It's Q times E. So this is basically, in a nutshell, what this, uh, uh, this particle is going to be. So it's going to really be under a net acceleration. It's going to be accelerated due to this one as Q over M. This is the acceleration of one of these charges. This is how much is going to accelerate, okay? Now, let me, let, before I do this analysis, let me go back in here and try to see how the current is related to these charges. Or let me redraw it because it's, we went too far in the bottom. So let me redraw picture. So all of this are supposed to be charges and they are moving at random and I have the cross section A in here. So what I'm going to do in here, I'm going to take an area A now and start counting how many charges pass by this unit area by this area A, okay? Let's say, for example, for the case of argument that these particles are drifting due to an electric field somehow in here in this direction with a drift velocity VD. So I'm going to assume that they have net, net drift now somehow due to this electric field. We're gonna find that net drift. We're gonna find this velocity, how it's going to look like in terms of the electric field. So I take a cross section and start counting how many passes per unit time. So I'm gonna find that the number of charge that pass this area per unit time, and I'm going to, that is a current. Okay, that is basically in a nutshell what the current is going to be. Because I'm assuming uniform motion, so those things are the derivative just becomes the ratio of the charges that pass Per, per time, per unit time actually, because I'm dividing by T, okay? So here is what I'm going to say. After one second, a number of charges that have passed is this many. Okay, for this material. And they are equal to the following. The volume in this case, 
and contained in this one. I know that they are drifting with a velocity VD. So the depth in here is VD, exactly. If you don't like the fact that I'm using one second, you can use any amount of time delta T. So after delta T, this length in here will be, the ones that were in here will reach this point in here already at this distance V times delta T. The volume in this case is area times height. So the volume is just the area times this V times delta T, V the drift velocity times delta T. So this is the volume of the particles that are in, contained in that region, okay? After a delta T amount of time, if you really don't like one second, if, you, if it's one second, just plug in one second in here, okay? So even a delta T amount of time would work, okay? So I start counting the clock, see how many pass. I know that they are drifting on average with this velocity. So VD times delta T will pass in during that amount of time delta T, okay? So now they have passed through this uh, area and I multiply by the area, I will find the volume of the number of particles that pass in, in delta T amount of time, okay? I'm going to make an assumption about this material because I don't know what it is. I'm going to assume that it has N charge carriers, charge carriers per unit volume. So obviously I need to know more about the material in the sense, how many charges are available for it? For example, is it copper? It gives you this many units. That depends on its density, by the way density of copper and how many atom each atom will give you available valence electrons in it, okay? If it's iron, it gives you this many and it's density and it's a different material. So now I need to count really the number of charges and each one of them comes with the Q charge. So if I find their number per unit volume and multiply by, by the volume, now I have actually found their total number. Does this make sense? So this is the charge uh, carried per unit dense uh, per unit volume, meaning I really, this is related to the density of the material itself. Because if I take a unit volume, I have this much mass in it. And it's also related to how many valence electrons, how many electrons are given by atom. Make sense? So this I have to know. Yes? If this doesn't make sense to you guys, this is basically the point in here. This is what I'm trying to get at. This is the number of charges. This is specific for materials. Even material will give you a certain number of charges. Obviously an insulator may not give you a lot some. So this N can be very, very small, if any, okay? For conductors can give you a bunch of charges per unit volume. So this is basically what the point in here. So this is a property of the material times the area times VD D delta T. Now this is the actual number of charge carriers, those Qs basically, in this volume. Which volume I'm talking about? This one that has passed in one second. This volume, the shaded volume. Remember the number is huge. It's of the order of 10 to the power 18. Even in an insulator, this number is still big, okay? Make sense? This is a property of the material. It's the, the density of charge carriers per unit volume. So this is the total number now. So this, the units for this one is just a number per cubic meter. And this one is Q square meter. And this one is velocity times distance, which is also meter. So the meter cubed cancel the meter cubed and we're down to just a number. Does this make sense? Yeah, it does now, thank you. Okay, very good. So basically at this point we have an N charges. Why is my sound, my sound uh, far? Am I using the wrong sound? Yeah, I think it's good. Okay, good. So 
Anyway, so this is the number of charges. Now, if I multiply, each one of them has a Q charge, by the way. So now, the amount of charges of charge that passes in delta T amount of time which is delta Q, by the way. Because if I make the delta T very small, I'm going to count less. But if I allow an hour, I'm going to have a huge number that has by. Same thing with the traffic situation. If I go outside, for example, on the bridge on top of the freeway and start counting how many cars in one second, I probably will find a few. But if I wait five hours, I'm going to have a bunch of cars. So that is similar to that situation. So that delta T will determine how many charges are going to pass in here. So it's going to be just Q because each one of them has a Q charge times this number, N times A times VD times delta T. And if I divide by delta T DT, that is what the current is. So the current in this case is going to be Q times N times VD times A because it's by uh, delta Q over delta T. So this is basically what the current is. Okay? Yes? Just basically applying this argument. Now, I'm going to find the current density now. The current density, again, we defined it as I over A, and you can clearly see from this expression that it's Q and VD. So this expression, because A cancels, so this expression is actually expression for the current density. Current density is actually a vector is equal to Q times N times VD for that material, the drift velocity. So it depends on which direction the electric field is moving. By the way, this expression that Mr. Uh, uh, Ohm was working with is actually a vector relationship because the electric field is a vector and so is J also. Both of these two are vectors. So it depends which direction the flow of traffic is. You could tell, for example, on Highway 91, the freeway, the, 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 the flow of traffic in that case is different than 215. So it's the same thing with the electric current. So this is a vector in this quantity in here. OK? So far, so good? Yes? Sounding good. OK, very good. So let me go back to finish the argument that I was making in here. So the, in the presence of the electric field now, we know that these particles are going to be accelerated. And this is the acceleration. In presence of E, we know that the acceleration, which is also another vector and the electric field is a vector, which is going to be just QE over M, okay? Here is the scenario. A particle that was moving at random had an initial velocity, and now it gained an additional velocity, which is just this acceleration times t. Because this is constant, and the integral of a constant is just, because if I want to find the velocity as a function of time, I have to integrate a dt, because a, if you guys remember, is just dv over dt. So v itself is just the integral. So this is going to be some from some initial value to a value at any given point in time. So this is going to be AT plus the initial velocity, which was a random velocity. Okay, make sense? Good? Yeah, so far. Sorry. So this is the actual velocity of the particles now, okay? I'm going to say the following, that this particle will accelerate until it hits another atom. So it just came off of, from a collision. And it came from a collision with a random velocity. It was accelerated for a moment by the electric field given by this expression. So it was accelerated by this expression QE over M times T. And then enters in another collision. So here is the scenario. We have a particle that was moving in some random motion, coming from a collision, actually. This is a collision. This is actually a, a charge now, Q, okay? And now it's accelerated. 
let's say for example now it hits this it, it hits another particle in which case it can come out in every which direction you might think of a random connection too so during this time between collisions tau the particle is accelerated and that is the effect of the electric field so it's going to accelerate the charges in between collisions but then when it collides with another atom it's going to go on a completely random motion and loses completely track of all of its uh, previous acceleration and accelerate again. You guys understand the process? So conduction happens when only between collisions, okay? So conductions happens, conduction is only relevant between collisions. So obviously this time tau, which is the average time between collisions matters a lot. Let me explain why it matters a lot. If this time is very long, we give a chance for the charge carrier to accelerate a lot and gain a lot of velocity, then loses its velocity. Then after that, it's going to accelerate again due to the electric for a long time. So it gives it time to build a lot of velocity. If this time is very short, immediately after it comes out from a random collision, it collides again and then goes random motion and then goes random motion. The conduction is very poor, if any at all, in an insulator. That is the case of an insulator. So tau really dictates the collision. It's not N. N is important how much material will make, give you available. All of them do, okay? But it's really this time, which is the average time between collisions, successive collisions, is the one that matters most when you're doing uh, conductivity, when you're doing conduction. So now, if I average this quantity, this one in here, the average of this V is the actual drift velocity. So the V drift, VD, is just Q times E over M times the average time, which is tau by definition, plus the average of the random velocity. And that average is zero anyway, because it could go anywhere. So I just average this quantity. When you average V, I'm calling it the drift velocity. When you This is a constant, of course, Q times E divided by M. And then when you average the time, that is by definition, the average time between collisions, tau. And then the average of a random quantity that is zero because it can be any direction you choose, okay? It can come out in any direction uh, various. So there is no way to control that. That determines only by the temperature, by the way, okay? So in this case, this number is zero. This is just a fixed number. So this is the drift velocity. So if I take that expression and put it back into the J in here, so we're in business. So J, is equal to n times q times the drift velocity. And the drift velocity, I found it to be q over qe over n times tau. So this is q, uh, let's write the first two terms, n q times qe over m times tau. Obviously, the key thing in here that emerged from this expression is this q squared. So this is basically j is equal to n times q squared times tau divided by m times e. This is exactly similar to the expression that I wrote earlier, sigma e, where sigma, this is Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Ohm's law. So sigma in this case is clearly in this approach is just n q squared tau over m. Obviously, the longer the time, the higher sigma is. The conductivity is good. The less tau is, the poor sigma is the more uh, resistive the material is. This is the same thing as one of a row, by the way. The more massive the particles are, the less sigma is. So ions really cannot do uh, uh, conductivity. It's electrons that can do it because electrons, their mass is of the order of nine times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms, whereas uh, ions of the order of 10 to the negative 26, sometimes 10 to the negative 25 kilograms. This is sometimes what? Uh, 
uh, five, uh, 100,000 to a million times more massive. So the conductivity of ions is very low. That is why the conductivity is really due to the charges in this case, namely the electrons themselves. The other thing also is making a big fuss over earlier is the charge really doesn't matter because look at the expression. It comes as a proportional to the square of the charge in here. So if the charge was positive, when you square a positive, it's positive. If the charge is negative, when you square a negative, it's still positive. So the conductivity in this case is the same. Finally, the number N in here, which is a property of the material, it has to do with the density of the material and also the valence electrons that are available for it. That too plays a role. So this is basically how the conductivity is. Do you guys understand the theory behind it now? Very good. You guys have never seen this theory. It's a good idea to basically think through it because it makes sense now, okay? Everything falls together in the picture in here. And this is just using F equals to MA. Let me be clear with you. This is not the exact theory, honestly, because it does not involve quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics really is the, is the heart of this topic in here, but this is a model and models usually are good if they lead to good experimental results like this one. So it's acceptable. But when you are trying to pick about, for example, what's going on in semiconductor, uh, this model will not work for you. Okay, So you have to really dig into uh, quantum, uh, quantum mechanics to understand it. But this explains more or less the extreme conditions, namely the good conductors and the poor uh, or the uh, good uh, insulators. Somewhere in between the fuzzy picture there, this picture is not really exactly correct. You have to involve more, 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 uh, more models, more uh, accurate models, okay? Which are still models too. So this is just the representation of what's going on. So now we have an understanding of this expression. Let me go back into the conductor and see what's going on in it then. Let me define a new quantity now, and that is the one that is wrong going to be working with, namely the one that has really the current in it. So there is an electric field in here. So this is at a higher potential V1, and this is at a higher potential V2. So the difference of potential V1 minus V2, if I'm assuming that there is a length L of this portion of the wire, obviously you can't have a current. If you take this wire, for example, and cut it, there is, <laughs> this is just a portion of wire, okay? I'm assuming that this wire continues itself and loops itself somewhere where there is actually con con connection. So it's like, for example, if you take a hose of, uh, 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 of water and you cut it from both ends, start studying the hose. In this case, there is no flow. I mean, the water will come from one end and go, and that's it. And you have nothing left in the, in the, in the flow. So this is just a model. So I'm taking an L length in here, and I know that if E is constant, and that is exactly what I'm going to assume in here, E derives from a potential. So it's minus dV over d, dr in this case, or dx. I'm going to take the x direction in here dx. So in this case, V will just simply be the integral of uh, E dx. And since x is in this direction, I'm sorry, I can take it from whichever direction. So from the, the beginning to the end. So the bottom line is that this V is going to be minus E times x2 minus x1. Okay. So I'm assuming If I start counting from here and take this V2 to be zero and this V1 to be V, so this is X is actually going in this direction. So an E is in the opposite direction just to fix the signs in here. So the final point in here will be X and the initial or L and the initial points will be zero and the end, the end, the dot product actually is negative from my convention in here. And this will be simply equal to EL. V is equal to EL, that's all, okay? And if I go back into the current density in here, written in terms of rho, so V, I mean E is, J is equal to E over rho, so that means that E is equal to rho V, rho J, I'm sorry, and E, I just argued to be a, uh, V over L, so here we have V over L equals to rho times J, and J is equal to I over A, somewhere where we define J. I over A, 
So we're going to express the expression. Basically, we want the expression between V and I because I can measure the V with a voltmeter and I can measure the, uh, the current with an ammeter. So that is what the goal is, is to get the expression between V and I, okay? So instead of writing Jane here, I'm going to write it as A over uh, I over A. And the expression that I want really is rho L over A times I. This is the goal of this expression here. This is one of the biggest goals in here, okay? So this expression that tells me clearly that Ri is equal to V, this is Ohm's law. That is, people talk about and they say, okay, verify Ohm's law, do Ohm's law. This is the one that they talk about, okay? The voltage that you measure with a voltmeter, the current that you measure with a current uh, with an ammeter, they are proportional to one another. This is what the purpose of the lab next time is. R is by definition the resistance. R is rho L over A is the resistance. The electrical resistance, and it's measured in R is measured in units of volt per amp, which is by definition an ohm which is capital omega, okay? So this is the ohm. So this is again, some devices give you that measurement, okay? If you look at this device in here, in the scale, it has the ohm in it, okay? Oops, it has the ohm in it. So uh, that's a multimeter actually, it can measure the resistance. The resistance, they come in everywhere in all circuits and we need them. So this is an R. The symbol for a resistor, which is one of the devices we're discovering now, is this symbol. So whenever you see that, and usually you see the value for it in, uh, underneath or above in ohms, if let's say, for example, this is a 10 kilo ohm, this is how they write it in here. So this is a big resistance of 10 kilo ohms. A circuit is said to be ohmic if it obeys this law. If you measure the voltage, with a voltmeter, and you measure the current with a current meter with an m meter, and actually watch and see how v depends on i, and you see it, it's a line. This is a line. This is like this. Then in this case, you say the circuit is ohmic, or that device is ohmic because. V equal to Ri. If on the other hand, this goes like this, for example, then it's clearly, this is not V equal to Ri. This is another one. This is actually an example of a diode. This is I uh, and V, they're proportional uh, in an exponential form. I is actually some constant times an exponential of some V divided by some V naught minus one. This is actually an, an ohmic device, okay? And a non-ohmic device, I'm sorry. This is a non-ohmic device in a sense that the current and the and the, and the, the, the voltage, they are not linear. They are actually non-linear, okay? So in the, this device, for example, if you're trying to use the same expression on it, you will not find that V equal to Ri on it, okay? V is not equal to Ri on it, okay? So unless you connect it to some device and you have something called the bias voltage, and you do some tricks that may gives you the amp, but it's not, okay? That is a not, that is where V not equal to Ri, okay? So linear electronics that we deal with in this, in this in linear electricity and magnetism that we deal with have always ohmic circuits, but once we get into superconductors, uh, semiconductors, I'm sorry, superconductor resistor relations doesn't exist at all because R equal to zero for superconductor, okay? For, uh, 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 for, uh, Semiconductors, V and I, they are not related at all to this fashion. But for a um, conductor, this is good enough approximation for it. Makes sense so far? Okay, let me tell you a secret, okay? If you really don't, don't care about the theory, that's fine. All you have to remember is this expression at the end of the day from it that is going to be required for your calculations. And the main thing that emerges from this whole thing is this Ohm's law, okay? So this is the item two of the discussion, Ohm's law.
I want you to put it in own, your own words. The voltage drop across a resistor is proportional to the current flowing through it, and the constant of proportionality is the resistance. How much is the resistance, which is important also for your calculations for the homework and everything else, is this expression. It depends on the, uh, the, the resistivity, which is most of the time is given to you. And the length of the wire, the longer the wire it is, the more resistive it is, okay? So the more these particles will get into collisions before they get to the other end. The smaller the, 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 the cross-section, if you really have to pass through current that is through the same difference of potential, the higher the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the resistance again, because you can't squeeze so many cars through a small narrow road versus if you have an open road in this case, okay? Hopefully this makes sense to you guys that the smaller the area, the higher the resistance, the longer the, uh, the length, the higher the resistance, and of course, depends on the material or O, which depends on all of its microscopic properties, namely the charge density. This is fix Q squared over M, like I said before, use the mass of the electron and the charge of the electron, which is 1.6 10 to the negative 19. So this number is fixed, okay? Q squared over M. The only thing that changes from material to material is N and tau, okay? So that is really how it is. Furthermore, it is shown that actually experimentally as the temperature increases, the resistivity increases from room temperature by a factor that depends on the change in temperature. So this is actually an experimental expression. Okay, the proof for it is beyond this course. This is the resistivity at room temperature. Alpha is a coefficient of uh, thermal, basically, uh, change in temperature in here. So alpha is property of the material again. Delta T is the change in temperature. So more the temperature, the higher the resistance. This is why when you're doing the actual lab, and this is something you have to be careful also in the questions for the lab, if you, if you turn on the current for the resistance, what you notice in this case is the, 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 the uh, resistor starts to warm, starts to get hotter and hotter. And as it starts to get hotter and hotter, its resistivity starts to change. So if you keep on measuring with, the, with, the, with it plugged in, you're not going to get an ohmic relationship. You're not going to get a line. Okay? Why? Because R, the slope itself, is changing with time, with the, with the temperature. So if this is getting hotter and hotter, you have to be careful with this relationship because you're measuring I and measuring V, but R itself is changing on you, it's increasing. So the slope will not be a perfect line. So what you do in this case, turn on your, 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 your circuit, turn on the switch, take the reading for the current, take the reading of the voltage, turn it off, go and do something else, record the data, change the voltage, for example, or change the, yeah, change the voltage. And then again, look at the expression again for the current, and look at the reading, record your data, and so on and so forth. So this is basically something you have to be careful with in the lab because of the fact that because of the ohmic uh, uh, heating, which we're going to explore down the road, joule heating, that is, we're going to uh, uh, see that the temperature starts to change because the material gets hot itself, okay? Case in point, just get your hands closed. Don't touch, but close from a, from a light bulb, and you will see it warm because it actually has a resistor in it, and that resistor is actually making it warm. So... So the resistance now depends on temperature. You have to be careful with that one. Because now if I multiply this one by L and divided by uh, R, uh, A, this is R naught and this is R. By the way, the same expression is true for the resistance. So resistance will change with temperature, with, uh, with temperature as temperature is increasing. So this is an important result that we will need. Let me get into back into the same discussion that we had about the capacitor last time around, namely when I take resistors and put them in series and when I take resistors and put them in parallel and see what's going on. So again, we introduced the battery last time, so we know a little bit about it. So what I'm gonna, going to say in here, I have resistors, R1, and I have a resistor, R2, and I'm gonna put them in series first. And I have somehow in here, I need a switch. Usually you will see me doing a switch and I have a battery in this case in here. 
what's EMF battery, what's voltage basically being epsilon. So what I'm saying in here, when the switch is closed, the current starts to flow in this direction, I. Once it hits this point, I know the voltage drop in here is going to be from this point to this point is going to be exactly R1I. The same charges as they pass through this resistor, this one, and clear it, they will come out in here. So it's the same current I that is going to go and run through the second uh, resistor, and it's going to be R2I. And then finally, that current will come in here of charges. Once they reach the uh, battery, the battery's role, as long as it's good, is going to take the charges and move them to the other side. That is exactly what the EMF is, what the electromotor force is. So this is the electromotive force. And this is basically what the stated on the battery. If it's 1.5 volt, that is exactly what is doing that, OK? So we're going to have a better definition for this EMF later on. For right now, it's once we define something called the circulation and we calculate the circulation along the circuit, then that is basically what the definition of the EMF is. For right now, this is basically the voltage drops. So if I'm interested in the voltage drop, let's call numbers. This is number one, this is number two, and this is number three. So the voltage drop between one and three, this is how much drop in voltage by some other way. This was, was V1 and it dropped all the way to V3, okay? In passing by V2. So the voltage drop between V1 and V3, which is really the voltage drop across the battery because these wires have no resistance, no drops in whatsoever. So that is actually the EMF itself in this case. So the voltage drop between one and three, which is actually V1, if you want to, minus V3, this is simply equal to V1 minus V2 plus V2 minus V1. Does this make sense? Yes. Good. Even if you have never heard of circuits or Ohm's law or anything else, you look at this expression and you see it makes sense because all you did was subtract 12, for example, in here or 27 and add a 27. So you didn't do anything. So algebraically, this expression is true no matter what. The voltage drop across between V2, between V2 and V1, or V1 and V2, is actually this resistance times the current. And the current is the same because we're in series. So I is the same. Same thing when we were doing the capacitors, we said the charges are the same. And that is really for the same reason, because this is a conservation of charges. If 10 Coulomb of charges per unit time pass in here, namely 10 amperes, that means I have to recover 10 coulombs per unit time on the other side, namely 10 amperes. So this is actually due to the charge conservation too, the fact that this current is the same. So in here, this is R1i. And the other one is just R2i. For me, this looks like the following. It doesn't look like this at all, because I can take R1, uh, and R, uh, I mean, i is a common factor in here looks like it's R1 plus R2 times I. It looks as if, not really, as if I have only one big resistor, which I'm going to call R equivalent, and I have actually a battery in here and a switch, if you like, and all of that, from point 0.1 to point 0.3, where I consume the point 0.2 inside, OK? So it looks like I only have one resistor in there, and this one resistor is behaving in such a way that it is proportional to the current. Its value is just the sum of the two. R equivalent is just the sum of R1 and R2. This is N like. So obviously, I have a three of them. I have just to add another one, and so on and so forth. This is N like the capacitors. For the case of the capacitors, when they were in series, it's the sum of the inverse of the capacitances inverted. That was the equivalent capacitance when we were dealing, dealing in the series. So that is actually kind of opposite to what happened in the capacitors. In the capacitors, if you remember, when we were doing a series, so let me, let me draw at the end a table, comparison between the two. So here is a comparison. We have series. 
we have parallel. We have in here, capacitors. And we have in here, the resistors. In here, in series, the equivalent capacitance was in such a way that it is one over C1 plus over one over C2 plus so on and so forth, okay? For the resistors now, we found that the resistance equivalent is simply the sum of the resistance. In parallel in here, the C equivalent was the sum of, of C1 plus C2 plus so on and so forth. In here, we need to find the R equivalent, okay? So let's do now the resistors when they are actually in parallel. Okay, so we have a resistor R1 and we have a resistor R2. And we connect them in parallel with the battery and with the switch, of course, just to get started on this. Usually the switch is necessary for safety and precautions and everything else. So the same thing in here, I have the EMF and I only need actually two points, one and two. And those points are exactly where the node is. So the difference in potential between V1 and two, which is V1 minus V2, I, I can go this route. And I'm going to assume that there is a current I1 in here and there is a current I2 in here in such a way that the current as it comes to this junction is going to be split. The current that is coming from the battery is going to split between these two currents. So I is just the sum of I1 plus I2. But the voltage is the same. The voltage, the first voltage is R1 I1, which is this voltage. Or if I go on the bottom, it's I2 times this uh, resistor. So it's R2 times I2, okay? Having said that, then, uh, and this is just V, it's the same voltage, which is just the battery EMF. So I can write this expression in here in terms of the voltage V. So this is clearly, I'm sorry, this is I1. Since this is clearly I1 is equal to V over R1 and I2 is equal to V over R2. So if I sub this expression here, I is going to give me V1, I mean V, it's the same voltage, over R1 plus V over R2. As if, if I write this expression in here, V is equal to R equivalent times the I, the same I that comes from the battery. So that means I is equal to V over R equivalent. In other words, as far as the batch is concerned in here, it looks like, it looks like, not really, as if I only have one resistor again. This is the battery and this is the R equivalent. And this is my switch, if you like to call that. Now, the point being in here is as far as R equivalent, V equal to R equivalent times I, which means that I is equal to V over R equivalent, which is V over R1 plus one over V over R2. And again, cancel the V of the battery and you will end up with one over R equivalent being one over R1 plus one over R2 plus so on and so forth. Okay, if I have a bunch of them. So for the resistor, it's the other way around when they are actually in parallel. It's one over R equivalent being the sum over one over R1 plus one over R2. The picture has been reversed when we were dealing with the capacitor and the, and the resistor. And this is a very important result that you guys need to carry with you for this, for this, uh, for this uh, stuff in here. So when we have resistors and capacitors and they're connected somehow in such a way that they are actually uh, in this fashion, you have to remember which one is which because these relationships, they are kind of not in the same forward direction. This is in a nutshell chapter 25, any questions? We still have about 15 minutes. I'm hoping to squeeze in some examples in here. No? 
So let's see here which kind of examples that we're going to do. As I was saying in here in the beginning, that this is really not we're going to we're not going to spend a lot of things on it. So we're going to do probably for example 70 or 71. Let's see here 71. Consider a circuit shown. The EMF source has negligible internal resistance. The resistor has a resistance R16 ohms, R24 ohms. The capacitor has capacitor 9 micro. When the capacitor is fully charged, the magnitude of the charge on it is this much calculate the EMF E. Okay, I'm going to do 71 to understand how we're doing this problems. Okay, so the example we're doing is 71 because 72 is identical except, I mean, 70 is identical except, you, excuse me, you have two capacitors in parallel which means that you have to get their equivalent and do all of these things. So we're going to do problem 71, okay, from this chapter. Again, the 15th edition. So what they have in this case, they have a, a battery. They have a resistor in here. This is called R2. They have another resistor in here called R1. Okay, and they have the battery's EMF is epsilon. This is the voltage of the battery. And they also have in parallel with this resistor a capacitor. And this capacitor's capacitance is C. And they give you the values in here. R1 is six ohms. R2 is equal to four ohms. And C, the capacitance is nine microfarads. When the capacitor is fully charged, when the capacitor is fully charged, there is no current flowing through it. So I is zero on it. So all the current that is coming from here is going through to this resistor and going through here. And that's the end of it. No charge can flow through this current when it's, there is a charge in here. So the Q they gave you, is 36 microcoulomb. So I know the voltage across it. The voltage across the capacitor is given by the, the charge over the capacitance C. This is from the previous chapter, chapter 24. So now we know the voltage from this end to this end, which is the voltage from here to here, by the way, too. So now VC is equal to 36 microcoulomb divided by nine microfarads. The micro and the micro cancel, the coulomb over a farad is just a volt. So 36 divided by nine is what, four? So this is four volt. But this is the voltage across the resistor R2, okay? So what do we know about the circuit? We know this voltage. We also can find this voltage from this circuit from here, from this current I. So if we have an EMF in here, E, because we have now R2 and R1, they're in series actually, because this one in here, the current, they have the same current. When you have the same current, it's series. Otherwise you can calculate this thing When they are in series, what is this? It's the same current. When they are in parallel, actually the same voltage. Here is the idea. Parallel is same voltage. Okay. So let's find now the current I is given by R1 plus R2 times I. But I know what the current is because I know the voltage is four volt in here. And this resistance is R1 is given to be six ohms. So this current that is flowing according to this resistance in here is equal to I, if I apply Ohm's law in here, because I know this voltage is four volts. Did I do it correctly? 36? Yeah, that is nine. That is four, isn't it? 
Okay, so now R1 is uh, I is given by this current times the, uh, the R1. So this is the same thing VC is the V across R1, which is equal to R1 times I. And this is equal to four volts. And R1 is being six ohms. We can find what I is. I is four volt over six ohms. And this gives me, uh, what is it? Two over three or yeah, two thirds of an amp, okay? Now we know what I is. We know what R1 is. We know what R2 is. R1 is equal to six and R2 is equal to 10, I mean four. So the total is 10 actually. So the EMF now is equal to 10, which is just six plus four, if you like, times this two thirds. So is it going to 20 over three, which is 20 over three is what? 6.67? volts, okay? We have 6.67 volts from this battery. Four volts are here. So we must have the difference, which is 2.67 across R2. Let's check that. Across R2, V across R2 is equal to R2 times I. And R2 is equal to four volts and uh, the current is two thirds of a volt. And this should be equal to eight over three and eight over three should be 2.67 volts. So if I add a 2.67 volt across R2 and the voltage across R1, which is four volt, I should end up with 6.67 volts. So it makes sense, yes or no? Okay, very good. Here is the key for solving this type of problems. Obviously, I don't know what the current is. But since they gave us the charge in here, being 36 microcoulombs, and they gave us a capacitance, so we know that the voltage in here is just Q over C, which turned out to be four volts, okay? Now, since I know what the current, what the voltage in here, because these two are actually parallel and parallel have the same voltage, that's exactly what parallel is is same voltage. Since these two, the capacitor and the resistor are in parallel, that means the voltage of four volt, which is across this one, which is 36 over uh, nine microfarads, 36 microcoulombs over nine, mi uh, nine microfarads, turn out to be four volts, is the same four volts across this one. But I know what R1 is, and I know what Ohm's law is saying in this case. It says that R1i is equal to four volt, and I know R1, so from here I can find the current, which is to be two thirds of an amp. Now I know what the current is. And it's the same current that is flowing in here because this is fully charged. So there will be no current flowing through this portion of the circuit. Because when it's fully charged, it does not allow any more currents, okay? You allow it only during the charging stage, which is, stage, which is actually chapter 26, and how to understand better the charge and discharge of a capacitor. So in that case, since we have that, then we are in business in here. Or did I, I'm sorry, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. We may not have, we may not, because this chapter, sometimes I run into each one another. And I'm just looking at the chapter in here to make sure that the charging and discharging of a capacitor is not really part of this chapter. And it's not, it doesn't look like it. I think it's the next chapter, okay? Actually, even some of these ideas in here, Come on, what is the charging and discharge capacitor? I don't even see it in this chapter. Charging a capacitor, that's section 26.4. Yes, it's a part of chapter 20, uh, 20, uh, 26, 26.4. 26 so yeah, so this idea of how to charge a capacitor and discharge a capacitor is actually coming down the road. So, but the idea point in here is that once the capacitor is fully charged, it does not allow current flowing through it. So initially, because it does not have any charge, actually what's going on in this case, all the current will go through the capacitor to charge it. So there is no current in the beginning once the switch, and technically you really have to have a switch somewhere in here. When you turn on the switch immediately, there is no current. If you put an emitter in here, you will not see any current flowing through R1. 
but you see a huge current in here, which is just the EMF divided by R2 in this case, flowing through this capacitor to charge it. As time evolves, you will notice that the current starts to go down in here. And this current starts to build up, okay? Which makes this current also changing with time too. So this current starts to change with time. And as it changes with time, trying to increase in R1 actually, and decrease in this capacitor until this guy is fully charged. In which case you will look at the uh, meter, you will look at the, 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 the device in here that measures the current and you will see zero current flowing. And then all of the current now is steadily going through R1 and R2, okay? So this becomes like an open circuit, like a wire that is basically open completely, no current flowing through it because this is charged. It does not allow for more charges to flow through it. End of the story. And this one now, the only way for the current once it hits this point to go through is through this one and goes around and closes the circuit. So this is in a nutshell problem 71, which is from this chapter. I'm trying to see exactly if there is some, some interesting problems in here that can be of interest. Okay, the typical problems for those of you sitting in physics for, uh, for C with me, they have seen this problem 59 uh, and uh, that is the problem actually where we, we made mistakes in it but we were doing conduction of heat there in physics 4C. This is conduction of electricity. It's identical analysis, identical solution, okay? Identical math problems, identical stuff. This is problem 59. For those who are curious, it's similar to problem 113 from chapter seven, 17, yeah, 17, yes. Okay, thermal conductivity. This is, and the expression are identical actually between this R and the other R, between the electrical resistance as defined in terms of the length and the area, and also in terms of the conduct, uh, the, uh, the heat, uh, the, I'm sorry, the, uh, the electrical conduct, uh, resistance in here. In there, they use the conductivity, which is just the inverse of this number, and that's it. But uh, they're, they're, we're dealing with the, the flow of heat. In this case, problem 59 is the same thing as that problem. So basically what you have, we have part of a cone that has a cross section on top bigger and a cross section in the bottom smaller, okay? And uh, it has a height of H and two different 3DI, R1 and R2. For those sit sitting in physics 4C, they know exactly what I'm talking about in here. For those of you in physics 4B, this is exactly identical to what those people were talking about in there, okay? And then calculate the resistance of the cone between the two flat uh, faces. Again, you're going to use the same expression in here, but you're going to take a certain height dy or d, uh, d, d from uh, that section, and you're going to use pi r squared, and you increase the length dl. So the expression for dr, I'm talking about problem 59, by the way. So problem 59. So what you have, you have this shape. So what you do in this case, you take an element in here at a certain height, y and y plus dy, okay? And the area in this case is going to be pi times r squared, okay? And you use the formula dr is going to be rho times in this case dy divided by the area a squared, okay? I mean area a, sorry, pi r squared. Now you need to find, and this is where we made a mistake in physics, where I made a mistake in physics for c, how the area a, namely how r depends as a function of y. Once you overcome that, you do this integration and you're in business and you can find Rs. So once you find how R depends on, which is gonna be a linear function, it's going to be R is equal to some constant A plus some constant B times Y, then you're just integrating one over Y squared, okay? When you do the change of variables, so you're going to do that integration. So again, if you want to, I can probably pose a solution for problem 59. And that is actually serves also for those sitting for C refresher on, uh, we just came out from chapter 17 also on that too. Okay, so maybe I will discuss another problem on uh, Wednesday, but then we're going to go straight into chapter 26, which we covered some of its content already. So we're going to do uh, the charging and discharging of a capacitor, which would prepare us for our labs and exams and things like that. Any questions? We still have a minute before we go into lab. Oh, lab, not with you guys, somebody else, some other group. 
let me stop the let me stop sharing first. Okay. <laughs> okay, one of you guys remember this discussion from 4C. Okay. Any question? If not, I'm gonna stop the recording. <laughs>